today because we have a grad retreat. This is a little bit loud in the back. Attendance is a little bit light today because we have a grad and young professionals retreat. Um, we have over 100 of our, of, our, of our grads taking a retreat. I have to apologize. I actually don't know. They're asking me for the, for the streaming. I wonder what topic is it? I don't know what I'm going to speak about until right now. So we're going to see what the Lord is going to give us this morning. I have a, like a lot. We're starting a series next week on, on Lent, on, on the special book that we had everyone buy. And I'm forcing you to dig into your savings accounts if you can't afford the book. Sell some shoes. Sell some clothes. Ask me. I'll get it for you. Get the book. Get the book. The book If God gives you the, the, the ability to see the spiritual things within it, I'm telling you, God will open up the heavens before you. I've been talking a lot with a lot of people lately about the spiritual world. We have a very spiritual world that, that we are a part of, and, there, and I'm going to talk about it more in the series. There is a very thin veil between us and the spiritual world. What do I mean by the spiritual world? I mean the Lord himself with the angels and the saints and the kingdom of God. And you can't see it because there's a very, very thin veil. And because of that thin veil, because we can't see the spiritual world and because we feel like our world is telling us to worry about like physical things and things that we can see, our hearts become numb. And so we need to, we need to really take this Lent as a time to be as I was saying in the, in the sermon of the, of the second liturgy, please obey your mother, the church. Your mother, the church, knows best. When the church says fast, it's for your own good. And when you disobey your mother, what happens? Kids, we know. When you disobey your mother, what happens? You get into a lot of trouble, okay? And so let's, let's what I want to talk to you guys about this morning is this concept of the spiritual warfare and the spiritual warfare of thoughts, specifically. So many people nowadays are suffering. I'm not talking about anxiety, like pathological anxiety, like the, the disease of anxiety that needs medical treatment. I'm talking about anxiety that makes us very worried and makes us very insecure and negative thoughts about yourself, negative thoughts about others. A distorted view of the world. Sometimes I speak to people and their view of the world is distorted. They're not seeing the world right. And you're saying, wow, there's, yeah, there's a few people that believe, believe it or not, there are so many people, too many people within the church. Their eyes are, the way they see the world, the way they see God, the way they see themselves is totally, they're looking through a, a lens that is, that is making them not see the world correctly. And the devil knows that the most important battlefield that he wants to fight on is the battlefield of your mind. The Lord understands. The Lord understands that if you want to connect, we connect with, not just with our mind, but first with our minds. We need to connect with our minds, and the devil knows that if I can fight the mind and the thought life, then I can do anything. Once somebody sees themselves in a, in, a, in a bad way, once somebody sees others in a bad way, once someone sees everything with anxiety and worry and fear, which is why today's gospel is about do not worry. And the Bible tells us, it says, we say this in Psalm 50 every day in the Agbeya. In the end we say, build the walls of what? Build the walls of? Jerusalem.
God see you. Let's say, I want you to remember, the worst time in your relationship with God, when you were sinning the most, doing the worst possible sins that you never imagined yourself doing, in your mind, in your heart, with your eyes, with your body, whatever it may be. What do you think, how do you think Jesus looks at you? How do you think Jesus looks at you? Anyone tell me. Does he see you in the light that goes on in your mind? Let me ask you, how do you see yourself? And what do you think that God sees of you at this time? God looks at you, and he does this. Right? What do you guys think? No, but that's what you think. Do like this if you agree. Okay. (laughs) Okay. I feel not myself, I feel sinful, I feel ashamed, I feel guilty, I feel filthy. And I believe that God is doing this. You're so gross. What are you thinking? Right? Isn't that what we think sometimes? And so that's why we don't pray. Who put that thought in your mind? I want you to think about the truth of the Word of God. I want you to think about the truth of the Word of God and everything Christ has taught us in His teachings about how He deals with sinners. Let's start with the prodigal son story. It comes from the mouth of Jesus. Many of us know the story. Son takes the inheritance, goes away, lives a very, very sinful life, and he says, I'm not worthy to, I'm not worthy to be called your son. He's making a plan. I'm not worthy to be called your son. I'm going to tell my father this. Make me one of your hired servants. And he goes, I want you to imagine you're the prodigal son now. You just did the worst possible thing you could possibly do. You are the worst son, the worst child, the worst human being on the planet. And you're coming back. What's going on in your heart? I I just want to die. (laughs) This is what's going on in my heart. I just want to die. But I'm going to make this plan. Maybe he'll let let me be one of the slaves in the house. Better than the filth of the world. And he goes back, and the Bible tells us that the father saw him from a far way off. And he came running to him and fell upon him and kissed him on his neck. And he embraced him. But that's never what the devil will tell you about you and your sin. Never. He would never allow you to believe that God loves you. And the best thing to do is... I can't have you know that God loves you so much. I can't have you know that God wants you back more than anything. I cannot have you believe that Christ will accept you. So I have to convince you that you have no chance. And he is brilliant. You see, the devil has been fighting against man for since since Adam. He knows how humans work. He knows. And as you mature... You were a kid before, and you talk to your kids, you know what kids are thinking. I was like you kid. I tell my kids this all the time. I said, you can fool anybody else. You're never going to fool me, because I was just like you. You know when they don't want to finish their plate, and they, they want to look like they ate their plate? You know what they do? They scatter everything around, so it looks like it's not that much left in the plate. I'm like, I did the same thing. I know. But you can't do that to me. You can do to any other sucker, but not me. Okay? But the devil knows that if he can deceive you, You're going to give up. And so, let's look on. The woman caught in adultery. She's caught. We saw saw you. We saw you. We know what you did. They bring her, and they say, all right, Jesus, the law says this woman should be stoned. Tell us, do you follow the law? So Jesus, in his wisdom, says, of course I follow the law. He who has no sin, cast the first stone. Any takers here? Anybody can do it? Anybody have no sin here? Of course, they all what? They drop their stones and they walk away. But Jesus gets down and he's writing on the sand. What he should be doing is picking up a stone because he has what? He has no sin. He should be picking up a stone and say, oh, lady, I got rid of all the bad guys, but unfortunately, like I'm the son of God and I know your sin and, and the law says that you should be stoned. And he says what? has her look up and he says, where are your accusers? She's guilty. She's filthy. She's guilty. She did everything. Where are your accusers? He says, they do not accuse you and what? I do not accuse you. Go and sin no more. 
This is the Jesus that we worship. This is the God who loves you. This is the God who sees you that you are worth more than all of creation. And because of that, he put his image on you. His picture on your heart and on your soul says that you are his. You're his. No matter how many of you guys have some old, dirty things at your house that maybe somebody tried to tell you to throw away, but you won't throw it away because it's, it, it's too sentimental to you. Your first whatever, maybe it's your first... Michael Jordan shoes, or this was, my mom gave me these earrings when I was like six years old, but they're like really cheap, and they're like rusted, and they're not actually that nice, and you can't wear them in public, but I'm keeping them. Why? Because they're mine, and, and, and they're precious to me. We're talking about earrings here. Sometimes, sometimes I go visit houses, and they have Crippled animals, like dogs, like a dog that has a limp or it looks funny or the hair is falling out. I'm not a dog person. So, so if I come visit your house, please put the dog inside the room. Okay? <laughs> you love your dog. I don't love your dog. Okay? <laughs> and people are hugging their dogs and they're kissing their And I'm like, ah, like, it's like, ah, I hate that stupid dog. Like, okay? And the dog is so ugly. And they love this dog. I'm like, just open the door and let it run. Just let, let it go. Put it out of its misery. No, Bruna, that's so sad. I love this little nasty little creature. You love this dog that is crippled. What does God think about you? The God of love that has put that love in your heart for that nasty little dog. He's got a love that is beyond measure. But the devil tells you no. How many times are you going to do this sin? You're going to do it 500 times? 500 times is, is a safe limit? Like, can we say that God would be the all-merciful if he let you do the sin 500 times? You'd say, that would be, like, that would be hard to say no to. But you fall in the same sin 500 million times in your life. God has endless treasure of love. And so what we're doing in the church, in this season, we're uncovering all the lies that we started to believe. That Jesus doesn't love you. That you've gone too far. That you're not, you're not like the priests. You're not like the monks and the saints. You're like, come on. God loves the saints and he does miracles through those people. But who are you? I put my image on you. You are as if you are to me. You are me. You are me. That's how when he put, he gave us Jesus in the flesh. When God the Father sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into the world to become man, he's saying, I want to show you what man is to me, that my son will become man. And bless our nature in himself. Bless everything in humanity. You see, the devil tells you that God won't accept you. The devil tells you also that the journey is too long to reach the kingdom of God. Too long. You know, sometimes we don't tell our kids, like, okay, kids, we're going on a road trip to Canada. They don't know, okay? Like, they think we're just going to, you know, Maryland or West Virginia. Because if I tell them that we're going to Canada and it's a 14-hour ride, I'm going to go through way too many arguments. <laughs> so let's just, kids, pack your bags. We're going on a trip. Where are we going, Dad? Oh, we're just going on a road trip. Are we there yet? Like after 30 seconds. Just a little bit longer. <laughs> okay? Don't look at how long the journey is. Because what you're imagining in the journey, what you're imagining in the journey is that I'm going to be by myself From here, and God is 500 miles away, and I got to go through all this by myself. But that's not true. Jesus is accompanying you on the journey. In order that, when you're saying, okay, God, I want to go to heaven, and I just want to be on this path to go to heaven all the way over there. What the Lord will do is he'll turn the whole journey into heaven. 
That as he's walking with you in the journey, in your deepest pains, in your hardest struggles, in your worst moments, that God is with you, carrying you. He is there in those moments. You guys have maybe read the poem of Footprints. In those moments where I only see one footprint. How come you left me? He says, it was that, the time when I what? I carried you. I carried you on this journey. So I want to ask you today, what are the lies that you believe? What are the lies that you believe? I'll tell you, there's a story in the Desert Fathers of a monk who was falling in a very, very evil sin, the sin of fornication for 11 years. Falling in this sin for 11 years. And one time, he fell in this sin. He fell in the worst sin. And the devil appears to him. He says, aren't you ashamed of yourself? What are you doing? You're a monk. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? And then you stand up and pray. Shouldn't you give up? Do you think that God accepts you? And you know what the story says in this beautiful story? It says, yes. When I stand up to pray, when I sin, you hit me on one side. But when I pray, I hit you on the other side. This is a battle between me and the devil. And that the devil is trying to make me feel like, come on, you're going to stand up and pray after you did that? Yes. Because that's how I defeat Satan. And that's how I invite the power of Jesus because I cannot overcome this sin without him. And so a lot of us are thinking, okay, like I just came back from a retreat. People are confessing. They say, Abuna, I haven't confessed for four years. And I just said, and he's like, you know, I was just waiting to be able to kind of fix my life. And then I was going to confess so I could feel a little bit more confident in myself. And I said, and that's why it's been four years, because you're never going to do it on your own. What you needed to do was say, I'm the worst person on the planet. I cannot do this on my own. Jesus, you want to be with me to help me in this battle, and you will fight for me and with me. Then I'll find victory. You see, the devil tells you to go on the journey alone. The devil tries to tell you that you're on this journey, and it's a long journey. Like Abuna, I've been praying for God knows how long. I still have this bad habit of lying or I'm addicted to Netflix and I just can't stop it or I have whatever sins that I'm battling with and it's been years and years and years. God knows. God knows. I might have given you guys this example before. I don't remember what I say or what I haven't said, but I'll tell you. I want you to imagine a child that has been abused. Okay? They, they've been abused, they're mentally disturbed, they, they're, they've been traumatized, they went through some, some difficult times. Okay? And you bring this child to a counselor, and the counselor sits with them, and this kid is disturbed, this kid is suffering, this kid has trauma for whatever reason. Does the doctor say or the counselor say, all right, son, I want you to behave in class, like after 10 minutes of, of counseling? Just go, ho- go ahead and start behaving and start respecting your mom and dad. Start listening to your adults. That's not going to work. Why? The doctor knows that we're going to be in a long process. That this child has wounds in their heart. And not because I gave them some nice words that are they going to just be able to pick up and start their day. No. The doctor knows that we're going to be in a treatment for treatment plan two years, maybe three years, whatever it may be. If you're a doctor or a counselor in the room, you can just nod and tell me that's accurate. Okay. And I understand that we're in a process. And this child is not going to be a perfect angel from tomorrow. God understands that. God understands you have deep wounds in your heart. And you have been traumatized. You've been wounded by the devil. You've been burned by the world. You've been like destroyed by sin. God knows that. So when he comes, he's not like, all right, show me what you're going to do now. It doesn't work that way. God knows that he's going to deal with you in your struggle. He's going to hold your hand. He's going to walk with you. And when you fall, he's going to pick you up and say, don't worry, I'm here. He's going to be whispering to you, don't go right, don't go that way, don't go that way. And you're going to go, and you're going to get hurt. God's going to say, I told you don't go right. Not because I'm just ordering you around, but I'm telling you, over there's danger. That's what's going to hurt you. God is with you on the journey. God is with you on the journey. There's also something... The opposite. 
other types of deception. The church fathers call it delusion. What is delusion? The thoughts of pride in one's own progress, that I've made it. I went to a retreat this weekend. We prayed a liturgy. We did the Jesus prayer. I'm fasting. I haven't done this bad habit for a month now. That's it. I've made it, Lord. I am healed. No. That's delusion. The devil has told you that you're okay the way you are right now. Continue in your strength. You're a saint now. You've made it. It's the opposite. So one thing he tells you, you're the worst sinner in the world. The next thing he tells you is, you're a saint. You're a saint. And now, stop the struggle. As soon as you think, I'm good now, and all of you will know what I'm talking about, you have a sin in your life, you have a habit, and you, you, you've found some victory for a week, two weeks, a month, three months, six months, one year, whatever it may be. And you're like, ah, it's gone. As soon as you say, it's gone, what happens? Your pride. God removes this grace. and says, you can do it on your own. Let me show. Go ahead, show me how you do it. And you fall, and you say, oh my God, I'm back at square one. And the devil tells you that you're back at square one. You mean I climbed up half of this mountain, now I'm back at the bottom of the mountain? No. The Bible says two things. Take heed, he who thinks he stands, lest he fall. If you think you stand, be careful. You're going to fall. And that's what David did. At the time when kings go out to war in the springtime, David stayed back. We've been killing all the other enemies. Everything is good. There's no bad guys out there. Nobody can mess with Israel. Let me just take a break. And he looks over his balcony, and there's a beautiful woman, and that was the end of David. Take heed, he who thinks he stands, lest he fall. So if you think that you're okay on the path, no, that's delusion. The devil has told you that you're okay. You have to say with St. Paul, I am the chief of sinners. I am the chief of sinners. I am not worthy of the mercy of God, and so I'm constantly begging. And by always being like that, you're going to continue to go up the mountain without realizing that you're going up the mountain. But if you realize that you're going up the mountain, and you're looking like, oh, I went up pretty high. That's it. That's game over. Take heed, he who thinks he stands, lest he fall. The devil knows the tricks. The devil knows the tricks. You want to know what the devil told St. Anthony one time? He told the Aunt St. Anthony after Anthony, St. Anthony is fasting, and he's praying, and he's doing all these things. He says, Anthony, rise up from your sleep and pray. Anthony said, shut up and go away. You say, why? Why? Oh, I mean, St. Anthony, come on, you're a monk. You should be praying right now. It's the middle of the night. You should be praying. You know what? St. Anthony understood the discernment and the tricks of the enemy telling him, if you stand up, and I'm, not, I'm talking about St. Anthony. <laughs> okay. I'm talking about St. Anthony. Not us people. Not us little people. I'm talking about St. Anthony. St. Anthony understood that the devil's trying to say, overwork yourself. God, like you need more. Over, until... He becomes so tired and so burned out that he begins to what? Despise prayer. I don't want to pray. Discernment. This is for St. Anthony. <laughs> if the devil can get you to wake up, to pray, wake up, okay? <laughs> like, just go for it, okay? But I want you to see the different tricks that the devil has from every avenue. He gives you anxiety, doubt, but what if my kids, and what if this, and what if that, and I might have failed as a parent, or maybe uh, the world is too hard, and, and the devil will begin to put inside of you all this anxiety. St. Paul commands us, he says, be anxious, it's a commandment, be anxious for nothing. Easy for you to say. You want to know why we get anxious? Because we don't believe that pain and difficulties are a part of our life. Pain and difficulty is a part of life. It matures you. It grows you. It connects you. And so because there is a fear that I might get hurt, I'm always living in fear. 
or that something might be a little hard, that something might go wrong, I'm always living in some type of fear. You might not identify yourself as an anxious person, but you might have some form of anxiety. You have a soft spot. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's uh, your, your, your spouse's view of you. Whatever it might be, there's some type of anxiety in you. And you're doubting God. You're doubting God. And the devil tells you, what if this happens? You're like, I don't know. What if your kid becomes lost? What if you go to church and you get COVID? I'm not going to church. What if you, all of these beautiful, all of these beautiful things that he's trying to, he's trying to say, be safe. Be safe. I'm not saying don't be safe. There's a difference between caution, that we take caution, and anxiety. Okay? We take caution in our life, but we need to trust in God. Our God is the lover of mankind. We call him in the liturgy the lover of mankind. He loves mankind. He's, you won't let your crippled dog okay, go outside, but, but God is going to let you just get hurt. God knows. And if God lets something happen to you, it's not going to kill you. Trust me. It's part of your growth. It's part of your growth. And so the devil begins to give us this delusion. We need to be... We need to be watchful. We need to be watchful of these demonic thoughts from invading the heart. Guard your thoughts. How do you know when the devil's putting something in your mind if it's true or not? How many of you think that the devil whispers a lot in your head? How many of you feel like, no, the devil doesn't talk to me? A lot of the negative thinking in your mind is coming from your own distortion. Your own eyes are distorted because of sin, because of the world, because you're far from God, because you're not praying. So your eyes don't see correctly. And so a lot of your negative thinking comes from distortion. But it also comes from the sound of the devil whispering in your mind. Well, how do you know how to answer? Don't think that the, that the devil is dumb, right? The Bible says that he is in Ephesians chapter 6. My mind just went blank, but I know where it is. Okay. Oh yeah. He says, Beware of the wiles of the evil one. Wiles are tricks, like the tricks of the evil one. What St. John Chrysostom describes this verse, he says, the devil is one who is skilled in the art of war. He's not going out with a gun and just shooting. No, no. He knows what he's doing. He's skilled in the art of war. So he knows how to begin to paint a picture from you that God does not love you, that God is not there, that God will not support you, that your kids are going to be lost, that your money's going to run out, that you're going to be... Today's gospel. Do not be worried about what you will wear. The, does, do you not see how... The lilies of the field are clothed, and Solomon in all of his glory is not arrayed like one of these. A lily. A lily. Solomon in all of his glory, who dressed the lily, the, the flower? Who dressed it? God did. God dresses the flower. He's not going to dress you. God feeds the birds. God feeds the birds. He's not going to feed you. So we need to fortify our mind with the word of God. In this Lent, if you are fasting, you will undergo, you for sure will undergo, undergo spiritual warfare. That's it. That's all I needed to hear, Buna. I'm not fasting. Thank you so much. <laughs> but there's nothing greater than if you do it right and you are fasting and you are praying, and you're asking the Lord for grace, seeing the Lord get you victory. I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in the life of people that really struggle in their spiritual life that I've seen God give people victory. Go into that war because you have Christ behind you. I'll tell you a story. One time in Africa, they were going to, in Congo, they were going to a place in Congo. Congo had a civil war at the time and the bishop and the priest and the deacon, they were all going to pray a liturgy in the Congo in the middle of a civil war. And they said, Bishop, if you come here, we can't protect you. It's a civil war. 
He says, but my people have to pray a liturgy. It's Christmas, whatever. They said, you come at your own risk. He said, we're going. They go, they bring all the vessels, the chalice and the plate and all of these wonderful things, and they go and they spend the night and there's gunshots outside. It's chaos, okay, it's craziness. Somebody ends up breaking into the house. So the house has two rooms. The bishop and the priest slept in a room and then the deacon slept in another room. These thieves came in, kind of roughed up the deacon, took all the stuff from the church and ran. Well, the bishop in the next door heard it. And so he comes running, he gets his staff, he gets his staff, and he's, his bishop's staff, and he's running, stop it, bring that stuff. And the people turn around, and they're like, don't shoot, don't shoot, don't shoot. The bishop looks well, like, what's he talking about? And they dropped everything and they ran, because they can't pray, they've driven 16 hours to pray a liturgy in Congo, now we don't have a chalice or a plate. What's going to happen? They saw something, the thieves saw something that the bishop didn't see. Because there is a spiritual army supporting you. There's a story of St. Isesoros and St. Moses the Strong. He takes St. Moses. St. Moses is struggling in his temptation. He says, Father, I can't endure anymore. This is too much. And he takes him on top of the roof of, of one of the, the, high, the highest buildings in the monastery. And St. Isesoros puts his arm around St. Moses. He says, look into this valley. What do you see? See, I have thousands of demons fighting for my soul, Father. He says, okay, now look over here. What do you see? God opened up his eyes. He saw ten thousands of angels with fiery swords ready to fight the war with him. He that is with you is greater than he that is in the world. You have to believe that. You have to believe that the Lord is ready to fight for your soul, for your children, for your family, for your eternal life. The Lord will fight, but you need to invite him. That's why we fast. Not because the Lord is going to come. The Lord is there and you're in His way. You're in His way. So God is saying, please just scoot over. Can you let me work? Can you let me work in your life? Just scoot over a little bit. And you're complaining and you're whining. And he's like, shh, be quiet. Sometimes with my kids, they're expecting something. They expect like they're going to get in trouble for something. And I've made a decision. I'm just going to show them love. I'm going to be gentle. And they're like screaming, and dad, I know, but like if you just would have seen. I'm like, just be quiet. Give me a hug. They look at me like, what? Give me a hug. And I give them a kiss and I smother them. He says, it's okay. It's okay. And they're fighting. And I just, Shh, shut your mouth. Be quiet. Let me give you love. Let me tell you that I have something special for you. Fortify the mind with the Jesus prayer. I'm going to teach you guys a way to sing the Jesus prayer after this. So we're going to sing the Jesus prayer. It's a very, we're going to sing it 10 times. I'm going to end here so we can have time. The Jesus prayer for Jesus Christ, Son of God, or in the song it's going to be Son of the Living God. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's it. One line. Lord, everyone say it with me. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. This prayer invokes the presence of Jesus. It brings the presence of Jesus in your midst, accompanied by all the angels, and no evil can stand in that place. Okay? So I want you to practice during this Lenten season the Jesus prayer. You're busy. You are washing the dishes, and you're always cooking for the kids, and you're doing all this stuff as you're washing the dishes. The, the dishes, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. As you're folding the laundry, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. As you are walking to your classes on campus, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. As you are listening to somebody who is telling you something that's very uncomfortable, you just say, Lord Jesus, in your mind, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Somebody is gossiping and you don't know how to get out. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. St. Macarius says, St. Macarius of the desert says, one must not say more than, Lord, you know, so be it. Lord, you know, so be it and have mercy on me. And basically, that's all you need to say. St. Macarius, the one who, like, he elevates when he prays. Lord, you know, so be it. Like, you do, you do what you see fit. And have mercy on me. I'm going to end here. Glory be to God forever. Amen. We're going to stand up. We're going to shut off all the lights. We're going to close our eyes. Shut off the lights in the back. 
Press the number three in that switch. Yeah. Okay, close your eyes. Close your eyes. Everyone quiet your, your, your minds and your hearts. I'm going to sing the first one, and you're going to pick it up with me, and we're going to say it very slowly. I'm going to say it very slowly. We're going to enter into the presence of Jesus. Born Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me at Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Son of the 
intercessions of the Holy Theotokos, St. Mary, Archangel Michael, the prayers of St. Mark, all the heavenly hosts, the apostles, the martyrs, the saints who have pleased since the beginning, make us worthy to pray thankfully our Father who art in heaven. Can someone turn on the lights really quick? Just a quick announcement. Once again, if you haven't gotten the book of the elements, get it.